So quick announcement, I've started putting some of my more lengthy and in-depth tutorials on udemy.com. It's an online learning website. I've taken several Udemy courses as a student and I found them to be informative, relatively well prepared and worth the reasonable prices that they charge. The website also makes it easier for me to organize multiple modules into a course, ensure that the lectures are properly ordered, as well as provide students with supplementary materials like code. However, I mean, I'm not here to promote their website. If you are interested in Udemy, I encourage you to always check out the free course previews before purchasing. Uh, you can also look at the course and instructor reviews. We all need to be careful with our money during these difficult times. Um, but what I am here to talk about is my video uh, on the XB Series 1 radio. Uh, it's part of my Udemy course on this and related topics. Uh, you can see the link to the course below. Check it out and enroll if you think that it's worth it. I will definitely continue to post shorter tutorials and lessons here on my YouTube channel. So we'll go ahead and jump into the video. Good luck and I hope you enjoy. So this section talks about the XB Series 1 radio. Specifically, how can we communicate a simple analog value from one S1 radio to another? Uh, note that much of this answer is taken from the Digi reference right here, which you can click on the link and take a look at it yourself. And you'll see this is a section with examples and guides. All right, so like I said, we want to send a signal from one Series 1 radio to another. That's the basic system that we're looking at. Uh, first, we're going to need to configure our XB Series 1 radio. Obviously, we'll need to purchase two of them. That's clearly shown right here that we're going to need two radios, as well as an XB Explorer USB dongle, uh, as shown in these two links. Now, what does this dongle do? It allows us to um, essentially connect the XB radio to this dongle to this connector and that provides the USB connection uh, port which we can plug into our computer and then that allows it to sync up with the um, X uh, the CTU uh, software so essentially this is the uh, adapter between our XB radio and our computer and you can see it just snaps nicely right in there all right uh, and these are available at most of the, you know, your Adafruits and your SparkFun. I'm sure that Digi probably also sells some version of it. Um, but the good news is you only need one uh, because you can reuse it uh, over and over, re reprogramming these radios. Okay, next, we insert the radio into the USB dongle connected to the PC. The radio will be given the address 001 and referred to as radio number one by default. Next, we're going to need to download Digi's XCTU application from this link. So I'll click on it real quick. And you can see here this provides uh, various versions of the XCTU hardware, sorry, software, and you can download whichever version is appropriate for your computer. Like most of the examples we do on here, I'm assuming you're using a Windows PC. I do use both Windows and, and Apple. Um, but for most of my development stuff, I rely on, on Windows. All right. So we install this software and it allows a user to configure a radio to meet certain specifications. Uh, I don't go through all the details of installing the XCTU application. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, so we install and run the application. We're going to click the discover radio modules button, which is right here. Uh, at the top left of the screen. We're gonna search all COM ports, especially those marked as USB, and set the port parameters as shown below in the picture with the appropriate baud rate and number of data bits. So we can see the figure um, below here. Uh, we're aiming for 9,600, eight data bits, and then a lot of these are just defaults. You could actually click all the buttons um, and it would still show the, the same devices. Really, you have to be careful here if for some odd reason you had a huge number of devices plugged into your computer, then you would need to use these characteristics in order to uh, specify which ones you're, you're talking about, but that's normally not going to be a problem. So to tell you the truth, you could probably just click all of the boxes and it would only show one device because you only have one connected. 
Now, once radio one is found, we add it to the current project, okay, using this button down here. And following this, the radio should be listed under the radio, radio modules uh, tab or, or menu item. Now, like I've said several times, I don't tend to hide too many of the ID numbers for the devices that I'm using. Even a lot of passwords, I'll just simply simply show to the class. I don't use these anymore. Um, so, I mean, you can go ahead and try to do something with it, which I'm sure none of this, none of you would, but there's there's nothing to be gained. I've deleted most of those accounts. Um, so I really don't take too much care with covering up a lot of the numbers. Okay, so next we're going to click on radio number one. This will bring up a set of radio parameters, and we are going to change the following settings. Specifically, the PAN ID. This is a parameter. Uh, it's a unique identifier that names the personal area network in question, and I just gave it the name 1234. Um, next, we are going to adjust the MY, that's the, the short uh, name, the abbreviated name, which is the 16-bit 16 16 source address. I'm going to call that 0001. This parameter defines the address of the source XB, which we're calling radio number one, and this address will be used by other radios to identify it. So um, again, we're just using a really simple setup here where I am calling this radio number one, and it's gonna be communicating with radio number two. So right now we're setting up this one. And so we gave it the source address 0001. Next, we're gonna set the destination address, uh, which is abbreviated by DL. And this is just the low part of the address. This parameter defines the address of the destination XB, which is this one over here. Uh, this address must match that defined as MY for radio number two. So what we've done is set the MY value for radio number one. Later on, we're gonna set the MY value for radio number two, and that should be 0002. If those values don't match, um, the destination doesn't match the address of any radio in this personal area network, then nothing will be communicated. It's essentially like sending a letter to an address that's gibberish or sending it to the North Pole. Uh, not that I'm implying Santa doesn't exist because uh, we all know obviously he does. But um, all right, next, a D0 is the DIO configuration for pin D0. And we are going to set this to ADC. And so this parameter, which stands for analog digital converter. Uh, this parameter configures the first IO line to accept an analog input, converting it to a digital uh, signal via 10-bit ADC analog digital converter. And obviously the XB relies on digital signals internally. Next, we're gonna set uh, IR, the sample rate to 20, and this sets the sampling rate of that pin to 20 milliseconds. So one thing, I don't know if I made this very clear, uh, but these, short names here, ID, MY, DL, D0, IR. This is how these parameters are identified within the software. They're all given these uh, abbreviated names um, so it's easy to refer to them. Okay, next. So we've configured our radio. We can go ahead and hit OK. And next, what we need to do is remove radio one from the dongle, we take radio number two. Both of these, again, should be S1 type radios. We haven't moved on to talking about S2 yet. And then what we're gonna do is follow steps four and five for radio two again. However, now we're gonna set slightly different parameters. The personal area network ID will be the same. The source address will be 0002. Okay, the destination address of radio number one must match the source address of radio number two. Uh, we are going to set the P0 pin configuration to a pulse width modulated output. So this parameter configures the first pulse width modulated output line to generate a result. And then we have IA, that's the IO input address, 0001. 
this input address of radio two must match the source address of radio number, I apologize here, radio number one. Note that because radio number two will not be accepting physical input, there is no need to configure the IO channels or define sampling rates, okay? So we didn't define one of the IO channels. Um, we defined one of the, well, the only, well, one of two uh, PO channels. Okay, so moving on to step eight, uh, we're gonna need to purchase two of the XB uh, breakout boards. There's a link in there, essentially just gives us access to the, the pins of the XB radio. Step nine is gonna be to solder jumper wires to the breakout board for these, these pins, the, the connections that we need. This is for radio number one. So pin one is a VCC and that needs to be connected to a 3.3 volt power source. Pin 20 is AD0. This is the first analog uh, digital slash digital input channel and it's going to accept the analog value that we want to transmit. Pin 14 is the reference voltage. Uh, this should also be connected to a 3.3 volt source. And then pin 10 is the ground and this should be connected to the ground or the negative terminal of our 3.3 volt source. Now step 10 has to do with radio number two and the connections that we have to make. So pin one, again, VCC, same thing. Pin six, as opposed to pin 20. So pin six is the PWM, the pulse width modulated output channel. Um, and this generates the, the, essentially what's gonna happen is we're gonna take the value that's measured uh, on pin 20 of radio one, digitize it, transmit that over the wireless channel, and then recreate uh, that output using the, the pulse width modulated output. So you should get that same voltage, or at least the average should be the same. And then pin 10 again is going to be the ground. So step 11, uh, we're gonna need to snap both radios onto their corresponding breakout boards, assuming all the proper connections are made. And then using the solder jumper wires, uh, we're gonna connect both XBs to their appropriate power supplies and grounds. And the user should supply an analog value between zero and VREF to pin 20, that AD zero of radio number one. So this is the measured value. Anything below zero will register as zero and anything above the reference voltage will just saturate and register as, as the maximum. And then hopefully we should observe that same value uh, at pin, let's see, six of radio number two. So input again is acquired on pin 20 of radio number one. The output is observed at pin six of radio number two. And again, this is not ubiquitous or, or, or standard. This is just the way that I set it up for this example. You could use input pin AD1 and that would change. Um, and so uh, anyway, we can use an oscilloscope or a multimeter in order to measure the output. We're here in step 11, but I did want to go back one second and just take a look at this link right here. Um, the breakout boards that you are most probably going to need in order to uh, work with this technology. And so you can see pretty straightforward, regular old breakout board, nothing too exciting there. It's pretty cheap. All right. So now going back to step 11, so we've snapped both the radios into their breakout boards. You can see this picture here shows uh, radio, um, radio number one and radio number two. I am using slightly different breakout boards. It just happened to be what I had laying around. And so, um, right, we, we have our analog signal coming in there and then being generated here as a PWM, pulse width modulated. Okay, in step 12, uh, what we can do is manipulate the analog input supplied to pin AD0 and observe its effect on the PWM. And so we have two examples that are shown below. Now, um, I'm lucky I have access to, you know, the an oscilloscope to, to scope this with. Um, not everybody will necessarily have that. So maybe you're using a, you know, a DMM. But you can get stuff like that on Amazon for relatively cheap. In fact, you can get an oscilloscope for relatively cheap. So I don't want to give suggestions on what type of equipment people should buy. But if you're interested in this type of work and you're just trying to learn more, you can get a, a decent two-channel uh, lower frequency um, oscilloscope for, you know, a hundred something bucks uh, if you get it used. Anyway, so what we can see is we have two different cases or two different trials, number one and number two. And so the input 
for the first trial is 1.69 volts and we get out approximately 1.65. For those of you that are not familiar with what pulse width modulated means, it simply means that instead of putting out a constant analog signal, it varies the duty cycle of a pulse that's generated and then the average will go up or down uh, accordingly. Okay, and then over here you can see I increased the input to 3.39 volts, pretty close to the reference, and it generated a 3.3 volt out, uh, 3.23 volt output. And you can see here that the the duty cycle is uh, is pretty close to um, I spelled that wrong, but duty cycle is pretty close to 100%, um, which makes sense because we're generating pretty close to the V ref that we're working with. And so this is a good result because it shows that um, the input is coming into our uh, radio number one. It's being transmitted wirelessly to our other radio, which is then generating uh, our pulse width modulated output. So that goes into pin AD0, and this comes out of pin P0, and we can see the change from one trial to the next. And so now we're going to move on to some other topics and uh, we'll learn more about this XB radio hardware.